Good evening, and thank you very much for joining us in this uh, celebratory introduction of the Quintessa 2010. We're going to do this with uh, Charles Thomas, Quintessa winemaker of great renown, and Andrea Immer, which I'm sure you know who I'm sure you know, and uh, a great wine writer and a master sommelier, and most important, she's been married now for quite a few years because she was married in the Quintessa property. And uh, get married there. We're going to be joined also by Larry Stone from across the country. Larry is uh, the master of master sommeliers, and he is in New York. And I, I don't need to probably tell anybody this. I'm, it's going to be an interactive discussion here, but I'm already getting tweeted questions. So I know most of you know that, but let's, t let's talk about how you can get there real quick. You're going to submit questions on Twitter to at Quintessa. Uh, you can visit fa the Facebook page, Quintessa Winery, and that's another place to post pictures. They also have an Instagram where you can post your pictures, which is at Quintessa Winery. So if you're tasting along at home or if you want to ask a question, I know you all do because I'm following you on my uh, phone here, then join us in that way and we're going to get started. I think first though, we should we should just toast everybody for joining in and, and to this wonderful opportunity to taste the release of the Quintessa 2010. So I know a lot of you have a glass in hand. Great. So here's to you guys. And Fantastic. Anyway, I forgot to introduce myself. Yes. I'm, <laughs> I'm Augustin Vineas. I'm the founder and uh, proprietor of Quintessa. Uh, a fabulous, beautiful property here in the heart of Napa Valley in the Rutherford area. And um, I'm really excited to be here, not just because I got married here, although that was a super <laughs> special thing. I feel like I'm your honorary daughter. Um, but also because it is really a special place. And Augustine, you have this amazing history in the wine business all over the world. You're also a pilot. You're also a cellist. But first and foremost, are you a vintner? Are you a wine grower? Tell us about how that connects to this okay. property. First and foremost, I'm a flyer. Um, second, I'm a musician, but the only one I could make a living out of was making wines. And um, so I have become very much a winemaker. As a matter of fact, I'm one of the few winemakers I know, winemakers, I don't mean to take your title away from you, uh, Wittner, that has dedicated his whole life to, to wines and being in the wine activity. Hardly can be called a business, by the way. Um, but it's, it's a fascinating and passionately loved activity that I've had since I was 25 years old. And a lot of you who are visiting us uh, on the internet and have a, a glass in hand are most likely people who have visited this property. And so you know how beautiful it is. If you happen to be somebody who's watching the, the broadcast and hasn't been here, check it out on their website and on the Facebook page. But you and Valeria had a, a vision for Quintessa as much inspired by the actual property as anything else, right? Tell us about why it's special. The property is, is very special. And uh, the way we sort of focused on our sort of lust to own this property is because after having been involved in the wine business all my life, um, I had seen terroir and properties that produce wonderful wines all over the world. And one of the very few places in the new world that have inserted a terroir and a class of wine into the international wine spectrum has been Napa. As a matter of fact, I think the only one. And within Napa, we discovered that Rutherford was sort of the cradle of what made Napa famous, of those wines that really put Napa in that international scope. And therefore, we thought, well, this would be a wonderful place. But then we were talking about geography and how in order to be a great property, you need diversity, you need a little bit of different soils, a combination of microclimates. And un I mean, almost unexpectedly, we found it in the very center of Rutherford. So when that happened, it, it was just amazing and it was destiny because this property and what makes it very, very unique apart from that is a property that had never been planted before and it had never been exploited in agriculture before. So this property has never seen one ounce 
of insecticide. It has never been uh, sort of moved the earth by big equipment. It has been pristine. And to find in the 1990s, which is when we bought the property, in the center of Napa, a property that had been sort of protected from the very aggressive agriculture of the 1970s and 60s and 70s and 80s, when Napa sort of began its big uh, thrust into viticulture, was totally unexpected and a, mir a miracle. So we like to think that it was destiny. We started out in Santiago, Chile, which is where I was born and, and started in the wine business, and eventually got here. And this property had been waiting for us all along. Christine, is that enough? That's, that's fantastic. <laughs> and I, I have to say, my husband John and I, we are both big time wine lovers, and we joke about how some of the great properties here, that level of stewardship of the land is to the point where they probably tuck the grapes in at night and sing them a lullaby. So I'm guessing you play the cello. For the I play the cello. Valeria sings and I play the cello. There you go. So they get serenaded pretty much nightly by two virtuosos. Um, I want to jump on one question real quick because it could be uh, it could be something that will be helpful to, the, to everybody watching. Um, from Twitter, Killabees asked, um, we decanted one bottle two hours ago and just opened another. First of all, we'll be right over. Um, and, uh, but secondly, the question is, what's the ideal length of time to decant? Now, should I ask that of Charles? Should we ask Larry? Who, who's going to jump in on the decanting question? I Charles? think you'll get a couple of different answers. As a winemaker, I'm always interested in what the wine tastes like as soon as I open it. So, right a pop and pour kind of guy and then watch it evolve over the course of a six hour uh, evening wow. and uh, see what happens. But certainly I definitely want to see what's happening with the wine right as I open uh, it. With the Quintessa, the comparison they've done will be quite fast. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Larry, do you have any other thoughts on that? Because, you know, you're, he's a master sommelier colleague of mine, I'm honored to say, somebody that I've learned so much from and I never have enough opportunities. So tell us a little bit about your thoughts on I think it depends on your taste. You know, a young wine uh, sometimes drinks beautifully right out of the bottle. I think the 2010 is a vintage that really is showing bright fruit uh, right from the beginning. So uh, it doesn't really need very much air time. But if you like to see your wines a little more open, you could decant them and have them uh, three or four hours later uh, when they're young. And they'll be even more softer and rounder and show a little more depth of flavor. So that, which is great. Now, now we've got, this will be interesting. I'm glad you pointed that out and, you, and the same thing. We've got like upwards of an hour here to watch the wine evolve in our glasses and that's going to be really fun. So, so right now, um, so I, I want to get to Charles for a second because we, we heard about this amazing property and, and the, the destiny to, for Augustine and Valeria to find it. Did that feel like a lot of pressure to come on the team and say, okay, now I have to do the handiwork of helping to, to maximize what it has to offer? There's certainly plenty of responsibility that, that goes with it. And uh, the complexity of the property, which gives us the beautifully complex wine, is definitely a challenge viticulturally. Uh, it's a wrinkle in the corner of Rutherford that gives us different elevations, different aspects, different geology in several different places. And... Uh, Technically, or from feet on the ground, it's a very complicated place to farm. What that gives us is those different nuances of 26 different vineyard blocks that I finally, walking the vineyard and tasting the grapes, break into about 55, 60 different uh, fermentation units because I see flavor differences wow. in each, each part of the vineyard. And I just have to respond to them. That's incredible. So, so, so fun in a way. You've oh, got a, sure. lot of, a yeah. lot of, uh, it's like a, a the mad chef in the kitchen with all these different ingredients to play with, and then you're going to turn it into one wine. Now, it's one wine of a property. What's the vision behind that or the thinking there? Well, I guess that my sort of tradition comes from, from uh, Bordeaux, where one property produces one wine. And I strongly believe that um, when you have a terroir like this, you seek out the best wine that it wants to produce. You don't go around saying, okay, I'm going to make a Merlot here. I'm going to make a Cabernet here. This is Quintessa. We don't, we don't denote it by, by the varietal component. What you're tasting when you taste Quintessa is the expression of this property. And Charles interprets that. He has to go around and interpret. What do you want to say, land? Or, in other words, what does God want to say through Quintessa vines and through Quintessa terroir? And that, of course, is very subtle. What 
to interpret what the property wants to do. But it is definitely a property that has its own different style. Well, so let's let's talk about style for a second. A lot of people say the word elegant. So, Larry, how do you how do you look at that? Is that is that a word that fits into your lexicon when it comes to describing Quintessa and categorizing it? Uh, yes, I think you know elegance is one of the words that you can use to define Quintessa. I think, however, you know elegance is a word that's sometimes used to denote wines that are not powerful. But I think that's the beautiful thing about Quintessa is that. Uh, like somewhat like uh, I like to make a comparison to uh, to a dancer, like great dancer like Fred Astaire, who who was you know to do what he did had to be very strong and had to have a lot of stamina to execute the kind of dances that he did, but while looking like it was absolutely effortless. And I think that's what Contessa has. It has a lot of strength and and power, but it, that's not what you notice about Contessa. What you notice about Contessa is how graceful it is and how effortless it seems. It has a beautiful, powerful, penetrating aroma that is, you know, has minerals and floral notes, but and that makes it seem elegant. But it doesn't seem like it's that powerful. And the, and the finish too, the tannins are very fine and and powdery and not not at all rough or or astringent. And so that also makes the wine seem again like it's graceful rather than powerful. But I think that's a beautiful thing about Contessa. It has both a depth of flavor and a, and a beautiful, graceful elegance to it that makes it both easy to drink and, 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 and delicious at the same time that it has a lot of uh, depth and a future potential for aging. So that's great. Let's jump into the glass a little bit more maybe. And if anybody who's watching and tasting along with us wants to, to weigh in with some of the stuff that you're experiencing or you want to share it with us on uh, Quintessa Winery Facebook page or at Quintessa on Twitter, uh, p please feel free to jump in. Uh, Charles, you know, talk about this wine, it, it, it descriptors that you're getting in there and kind of, uh, you know, this is a 2010 vintage, we'll get to vintage in a second, but let's just first talk yeah, about the wine vintage. itself. Uh, it's got beautifully bright fruit. Uh, I'll, I'll speak to it a little bit more in later, but I think that's one of the things you get from a cooler vintage is uh, this wonderfully bright, complex fruit. Uh, you can, in the mouth, you can, you can sense the, the, the strong richness in the middle, but at the same time, as Larry said, this is a wine of, of, of finesse and elegance, but with the requisite power underneath it. And it, it shows that, especially as you get into the, uh, to the finish of the wine. And uh, red fruit and black fruit at the same time, which is one of those, the hallmarks of Quintessa. And it comes from the, the different, uh, the, the geology that we've got. It's going gonna, it's gonna to give us that every year. Now, there's a tasting term that some locals don't like to refer to, and it's Rutherford dust. <laughs> And I'd like to know if you buy into that notion, and if so, do you think it, it's a part of the Quintessa profile? You know, I am not that good a taster that I can distinguish the dust or the commonality among all of Rutherford wines as different from the Oakland wine, to be frank. Sure. Okay? If I were a wine writer, I would probably talk about the Rutherford dust as if I really knew what I was talking about. <laughs> but in all honesty... I, I don't know what they mean by Rutherford dust. If there is such a thing, I'm sure we have it. But um, so let's let's throw this one to Larry real quick. For we're we're uh, phoning for a lifeline there. What do you think about that? I don't, I'm not sure we got. Oh, we, I should okay, say that, that uh, a priori that I have a vested interest in Rutherford dust because I was the president of the Rutherford Dust Society for three years and vice president for two more, uh, and uh, and I, I love Rutherford. But that given that, I think that. Um, the, the, the quote for Rutherford Dust came from Andre Telechev, with whom I had the pleasure of working with when I was a young, young you know, sommelier uh, in Seattle, and he consulted for a number of places, including for a, a winery up in Washington State. And uh, the fact is that the idea was that to be great, California Cabernet had a Rutherford Dust. It didn't mean it had a special quality that uh, made it dusty like Rutherford Dust. It, it meant it had to be rooted in Rutherford soil. Because when uh, Andre looked at that, of course, he worked at BV, but also he looked at his neighbors. And, and I think if you look at that part of, of Napa Valley, you have the best microclimate, the best macroclimate, I should say. You know, it's not a microclimate, a macroclimate in Rutherford for Cabernet. And, and I will be grace, gracious enough to extend that into part of St. Helena, in the south part of St. Helena, in the north part of Oakville, where you have, like, the perfect, like, coolness without foggy mornings. So you get early morning sunshine, you, you have longer sunlight hours than you do if you go farther south in the valley and you have more sunlight than if you go north 
in the valley, and you have more moderate temperatures. So I think Rutherford is like the, one of the greatest spots. Given that, you know, every terroir has a little special microclimate. I think Quintessa has a very special place within Rutherford, and you see that with um, uh, Professor Swinchad did a soil series. You have these great, great hills in, in Quintessa that allow for such a wonderful variety of soil that uh, the dust in, in Quintessa is a special subset of Rutherford dust, I believe. Very cool. So, you know, you, Augustin, you mentioned um, the, the pedigree of Rutherford in general for Cabernet. Larry, you made reference to it with Andre Chalachev, famous enologist. Uh, you mentioned BV, Beaulieu Vineyard, which is one of the ones that really sort of put Rutherford on the map. And, but there are a couple of other Rutherford names that really sort of, uh, kind, of kind of glued the reputation of the Appalachian together. Larry Inglenook, um, what are some other ones that you would say have, have kind of put this on the map? and that Quintessa is kind of joining that, that group. Well, I think, you know, uh, you know, I was at, I was in Inglenook, and so as a president of the Rutherford Dust Society, if I mention any particular one, I might, uh, I might insult others, but I mean, right <laughs> next door across the road, you have, you have Camus near there. Uh, right. You have, uh, I think there's some Frank family, which is another newer winery, but old families. You have, uh, yeah. you have, you know, Gary Morisoli with the Morisoli Vineyard, you know, a very historical vineyard with dozens of grape varieties planted right next to each other on the, on the west side there. And uh, you have a number of other places that are just, you know, have, it's a, it, frankly, Rutherford is the birthplace of Napa Valley as an idea for making great Cabernet. And, and uh, Gustav Niebaum started in 1880 by devoting that vineyard primarily to great Cabernet, although he had other varieties. But other farmers like the Morisolis have been there. They planted, they planted Inglenook in the 1880s, and they are continuing to farm there. Uh, so I mean, there's just a great history. And Davy Pena is across the road. He's one of the great farmers, and a, from a great farming family. And uh, as I mentioned, the Wagners having uh, came as the Wagner family, and all their cousins are out there. So it's a, it's just a place with a great history. So it's a great neighborhood, to say the least. Um, we have so many questions about vintage. We're going to talk about specifically the character of the 2010, but I've got, we have some very, some major Quintessa heads here. We've got um, a question, and this is uh, from several different users, but um, uh, Don Gutierrez asked, among others, um, how does 2010 compare to the vintages since 2005? So we'll get to that in one second. And Larry Kranowitz asked, he says, I've tasted every vintage since 95. Pretty cool. Where do you place the 2010 as far as top vintages go? So why don't we characterize 2010, and then I think you guys can speak to how it compares um, to the other ones, and, uh, and we'll just jump right in, and, and maybe we'll get Larry then to weigh in on where he thinks it's going in terms of an aging profile with so much tasting experience of wine across the world and obviously across Appalachian. But let's start with 2010 as a, you know, how so, be Yeah, climatically, it was a cool vintage. Uh, from really from start uh, through the finish. We had rain in, in the spring that delayed bud break. So it was, it was a, a vintage that started a week or so late. The weather stayed cool through August. Uh, there were two heat spikes, one in uh, late August and another one uh, in late September that made things exciting for us. Um, my first year in Napa Valley was 1973 and all the weather since then has been an aberration. So you started when you were 12. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, uh, the weather certainly is, we've, we've had uh, dramatic weather stories. Uh, winemakers like to tell those anyway, but we certainly had those the last uh, five or six vintages. Uh, 2010 was, uh, had all the, the strengths of a cool vintage and that it's got this beautiful bright aromatics in the right places and with the right care taken to mitigate the issues that uh, came with the heat spikes. You have wines that have the wonderful ripeness, but with the purity of aroma that you get from wonderfully cool vintage. So I think you really, in here, I think you see the best, the, the best of both worlds, a fully ripe wine that's got all the, uh, the, the depth and length that you want from a fairly small harvest, but uh, with uh, the complexity for aging and very nice acidity also natural acidity for uh, plum vintage. A lot of herbs. Now, in terms of, of uh, where it fits um, within, since 1995, where it would fit as a vintage ranking. Larry, can you speak to that? I mean, obviously you taste all the great wines of Napa Valley all the time. We recently got a chance to, uh, to be on a panel of a, a vertical of one of the great Napa Valley wines. So can you kind of help put this in context and then maybe talk about what you think is the aging horizon for this 2010? 
Well, I think the 2010 is a, somewhat like the 05, but uh, it's very delicious fruit. is a cooler vintage. I think the yields are lower, though, than they were in a lot of uh, previous vintages because it was such a dramatically cold season through most of the year. I think the other beautiful thing about it is that because of the, the growing season being fairly long but cool, uh, you have a great intensity of flavor and you have great development of the phenolics of the, all the, the, the flavoring components that make a wine interesting. And so there's a lot of depth of flavor, but it's it's a little bit brighter, it's a little bit lower in alcohol, so it has a little less weight on the palate, it's a little a little less alcohol as a result as well. So it's a more classic kind of a, a, a wine that would be more in a Bordeaux mold. I think it will age a very long time, it's hard to predict exactly how long, but you know, for sure it's, it's delicious now. Probably within a year or two it'll go through a little bit of a tight phase because it has the, this beautiful balancing acidity and lower alcohol. And then probably in uh, four years from now, it'll come out again. So I think for the next two years, drink it, then for, there'll be a one or one and a half years in which you might not want to touch it, and then it'll come out again and evolve for another to another 10 years. And beyond that, it's hard to say you know, where it'll plateau because it's still so young, but I think it has a long life ahead. I don't, there's any, don't think there's any problem with it aging for 15 or 20 years uh, and improving over the first you know, 15. Uh, and you know, holding it on, uh, holding onto it longer may, would probably not hurt it. But I think probably the maximum uh, development will be about 15 years for this wine. And then uh, you know, other vintages uh, like the 09, which came before it, are very different. Like the 09 is more like the 99 vintage, which is a very big year, very warm, kind of expressive uh, wine. It's a little more voluminous in alcohol, so it's for it's a different style. It works with different kind of food. And it will, it, it's a little denser wine, so that'll take maybe a little longer to evolve. But the 10 is, the nice thing about the 10 is because of that brightness and because it's a little more uh, classic, it's going to be beautiful right from the beginning, at least for a couple of years. So you can wait, and you can wait till some other vintages come along that you want to drink at a young age and uh, enjoy this for the next two years while you're waiting for other Quintessas to mature. I'm really glad that he pointed that out because I think that people don't realize they associate sort of a dumb phase with Burgundy uh, Pinot Noirs from France, but I find that Napa Valley Cabernets too go through that closed phase that Larry referred to, and a lot of times it's that catch-22 because you get to the restaurant and they have the current release that's within that one to one and a half year time frame that Larry mentioned, and it's it's not necessarily you know going to be suited to be at its best. So that's something that everybody who is going to you know check your email and and get your allocation, you know have enjoy a bottle or two with the baby fat, and then you know be aware that within that kind of window that Larry talked about, that it's probably going to shut down a little bit, and you probably want to go to your back vintages. Now on that, you guys I'm sure have the chance from time to time to drink the back vintages out of the library. Are there any highlights for? people who are part of the Quintessa family and have some of them that are sort of like really opening up and looking super pretty now, Augustine? I, first of all, I'd like to, I was just thinking about all of these um, descriptors and how the 2010 is different from the others. And I was thinking, maybe we're not talking about something which is even more important, which is that they're all similar. There's a commonality to Quintessa, which to me is very powerful. Um, and I think that to, to concentrate on the difference between one year and another is, is fun, mm -hmm. but the truth is that the beauty of Quintessa is its consistency through the years. And of course there are differences, and those differences change with age. Mm -hmm. I, I just tasted 2002, which is amazing, you know, beautiful. Ah, but uh, in terms of the 2010, I think that this is the, the wine most delicious when just released, like right now. I, I, the, or maybe it's my palate, you know, I'm not as good a taster as, as the three of you are, Larry, Charles, and Andrea, but um, for me, this wine is very, very delicious up front. I know it's going to go through a phase, and I think it has the wherewithal to really come back with age, with different characteristics, just like the 2002, uh, and it's going to be a beautiful wine, different and beautiful. So it's really what you like. Where you you like the fruit, or do you like the characteristics that come with age? So we, we can talk about that, Brown. And and you know everybody's different in terms of uh, uh, everybody's different in terms of their preferences. I kind of like both. I enjoy the experience of both, and it kind of depends on the, the occasion and the food. And we'll get to food pairing uh, in a second. But I, I'm just seeing some of our people who are tuned in. 
and uh, it looks like we have quite a few um, quite a few people now ready to uh, possibly weigh in and let us know what they're uh, what they're thinking. Jim and Linda Alves, if I'm saying that right, have quite an amazing little setup. Um, I don't know if you're at your house, but if you are, that's yeah. pretty cool. Either that or they're calling in from Tuscany. Yeah, they're calling in from Tuscany. So um, if you guys want to let us know anything that you're thinking, we'd love to hear from you. So it sounds like right now we're not, we got it. We got a good toast to the camera. That's good. I don't know that we're hearing your audio. So thank you for that. And we'll, if you want to, uh, Send us a, a written question on the Facebook page, or rather, rather on Twitter. That would be great. Um, otherwise, we'll uh, we'll try to catch some audio from you guys in just a little bit. Um, I wanted to go back to um, something that I think is real important to the overall efforts towards quality with Quintessa, and that's the court question. Mm -hmm. Because if there's anything that's um, you know that is truly the, the bane of the existence of a sommelier <laughs> or a vintner. It's a cork that's flawed and that taints the wine and doesn't make it, you know, dangerous to your health, but it can sure take away all that nature and skill put into the bottle. We're talking about TCA, which is that little, that little substance in certain corks that makes the wine smell like wet newspaper on your doorstep. Um, so, uh, and it's not a good thing. And what do you do about it? Well. Uh, other than yelling at the cork salesman over the years, which right. didn't seem to do too much good, I finally, uh, I was doing that one time, and one of the cork salesmen said to me, hey, you know what, we're actually doing something about individually testing cork. <laughs> I've been yelling at people, or, so to speak, for, for a number of years about this. Basically, the idea would be to find a way to have zero tolerance for, uh, for off, off aromas in a cork. The last thing that a winemaker does to a bottle of wine is going to get them a one to two to three percent uh, defect rate, and that's just uh, oh, all of you have tasted a bottle of wine that had that happen. So I don't have to. I, I know you share in uh, in uh, my frustrations. Um, and we uh, found a cork company to work with that uh, had come up with a way to individually test each cork. And it sounds crazy, and about half the time I think it is, but the other half of the time. Uh, with the results we've gotten with the 2009 vintage and now with the 2010 vintage, uh, it really feels like it's worth it. And we put each cork in a baby food jar and equivalent, put in a few drops of water into it, close it up, come in the next morning and have people who've been tested at super sensitive levels sniff for off, off aromas and kick the corks out that they, they feel have off aromas. And uh, with the 09 vintage, we saw a dramatic uh, improvement and uh, a reduction in, in uh, an already small uh, incident. And with the 2010 vintage, just from the preliminary numbers we've seen, we've seen that uh, drop again. And the goal How much does that is, cost you? Uh, <laughs> well, it actually costs us about 30 cents a cork on a cork that we already pay about 95 cents to a dollar a piece on. So it's a significant uh, percentage. But mm -hmm. uh, the question we asked ourselves, and uh, Augustine and I and Augustine Jr. asked ourselves is, if the genie came down to you and said, the Alvises are about to open a bottle of Quintessa that's corky, how much would you pay to uh, have that be a good bottle? You'd pay more and than that. And I'd pay $10 in a heartbeat, and I'd pay 20 or $30 if, if that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Finally, uh, if we're able to reduce the percentage down, we've gotten it down well below a half percent at this point already, and we think we can go lower. Uh, that it's worth every bit of it. That's and if fantastic. I could drop it to zero for another 20 or 30 cents a piece, I'd do it. That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, let's hear from uh, John and Stacy because uh, you guys are, are hanging out in uh, looks like your dining room. And um, I, I can't see your glass from the, from the uh, uh, view that I have. But mm -hmm. um, you obviously have a chance to taste the wine. What, what do you think? Oh, you're well, snacking. Well, something too. We're not drinking a bottle tonight. We've been up at the winery and tried the uh, 08 and 09 vintages, but uh, enjoyed them. Um, I think they, they were really showing nice, um, really graceful wines, you guys say. Uh, but I had a question as far as the corks. Like, what are you looking for? I mean, do you look for how the cork sizes to the bottle itself, uh, the opening, or is it the length, or does that matter? Or is it just the, the odor it gives off when you're testing it? I mean, what is, what is those concerns? So yeah, there's a number of things that matter in a cork. First is sensory, which is 
to have it be as, in effect, as neutral as possible, not to be giving any off, off character. Second thing is the physical structure of the cork. And that's something that uh, we've historically tested by looking at the exterior and grading the exterior. People are starting to do some pretty interesting things with x-raying corks to be able to look inside. Because finally, what keeps that bottle of wine in good shape, if you've stored it right to start with, after 10 or 15 or 20 years in the bottle, is the physical structure of that particular cork. And so the consistency of that ends up being really important. You go to the right forest that uh, have the uh, that take a little bit longer to grow the cork. There's a little bit more density there, and that ends up being something that's, that's very important. Along the way, there's a number of uh, sorting processes that the producers uh, have to get to the very best corks on what they feel are the best ones. As I say, on top of the physical grading, now we're doing sensory. Wow. So obviously a lot of attention to detail on something that you know is is a necessary i wouldn't even say evil because we love to pull a cork there's something about that that's exciting there's nothing better than a good cork to close a bottle of wine there's nothing worse than a bad cork our goal is to get it up to the top part and uh, let somebody else worry about the uh, the, the lower end of that right so now we we've talked about this vintage do we have a question that's Linda's favorite sound. And I'm an expert. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that one. Yeah, we all love that. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Definitely. It just it, it means that the, the relaxation part of the day has begun, right? And I think we're all for that. Um, Can I add something? Please do. What, what I was just thinking, because I just read an article about it, is this. The court goes back almost to medieval times. So we have come a long way in everything but we're still trying to get the court to work. You just heard all the absurd things he goes through <laughs> to try to get it to work. And what I've experienced and heard and read is that there are better stoppers for wine. You can reproduce a cork. Even the noise you can reproduce. You can do anything. And you know that wine comes from a European heritage, of course, a tradition. And European traditions get stuck. The, the, the Europeans tend to be very, very um, attached to their traditions, absurd as they may be. And I suspect that when something like wine falls into the American culture, which it has now, it's going to be changed. And I predict that corks are going to be one of the things to go. And, and you know that we have already played a very major influence in wine, like the silly num numerical ratings on wine. That was an American invention. Denominating wines by their varietal name is an American invention. And and like that, we can go on and on. It's very powerful, and I suspect that the packaging, and particularly the cork, in the next ten years, is going to be some significant changes. Well, I, I'm sure that winemakers want alternatives that will be sound and reliable, but also give you that for a wine that is, is intended for aging and will get better with age, which isn't every wine. It's a small percentage of wines, but that Absolutely. very, very tiny interplay of uh, air with the wine is really critical to its graceful evolution, right? I think so. There's, there's science that goes both ways on this, Okay. but uh, what, it, what it appears is that the, a very, very minuscule uh, level uh, does, does uh, give you some development, but I think there's, there's still some people doing some very interesting science as we speak about just that. Well, I remember actually, Augustine, when you were, when you were the proprietor of Franciscan and several of those other properties in the um, Icon Estates, you used to host a sommelier summit. And I remember that we used to actually, that your team would put together trials of the same wine with different closures that had different attributes of the air exchange, among other things. And it was absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Um, it was, we were a little bit sort of part of the guinea pigs in that research. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it was really interesting to see, but, but still so much more needs to be done, I think, right? Well, but, you know, and, and tradition plays a big part. I mean, Quintessa is certainly not going to be the first to go out there with a funny new stopper, I assure you. <laughs> wow. All right. So I, I have a, 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 um, a um, groupy question for you, Charles, um, from Danielle. Uh, she's calling you a genius. And uh, so that might be 
you, is that your, your mom? Just kidding. No, yeah. he's definitely a genius. But obviously, Danielle's a big fan, so it's great. And she, um, she says, can you touch on gravity flow production? And if that lends more elegance to the Quintessa profile, and if you would go back to the uh, little bits of baby steps and explain, don't assume we all know what gravity flow is, just to give a real quick what yeah. that means. So Danielle, I don't think it's a groupie, but she's a, she's a well-placed show, I guess. Excellent. Too. So <laughs> thank you, Danielle. Um, yeah, gravity flow, basically, when we talk about gravity flow and winemaking, it's how you get the grape from the grape receiving area into the tank as gently as possible. And uh, there is no better way to do it than with gravity. Uh, when I first started in the wine business 30 some years ago, we, were, we would pump grapes from the, the destemmer and crusher, and they weren't the uh, most elegant, uh, uh, gentle things in the world either. Uh, sometimes 100, 200 yards into the tank. And in doing that, you're chewing up grape skins, you're chewing up grape seeds, and you're certainly not getting whole berries into the tank. With gravity, you have the opportunity, if it's well designed, to get the berry effectively in the same condition that it was on, on the cluster, removed from the stem into the tank. And that gets you, uh, it, it assures you of not having any unnecessary uh, cracking of, of seeds, which can give you uh, bitter tannins, or uh, chewing up of the grape skins, uh, uh, which can give you more solids in the wine that make it harder to clarify. And so what you really get out of it finally in this glass, the thing that, that, that I see with, uh, with careful handling of grapes especially, but all the way through the process, is a wine that shows more clearly the character of the grape from the vineyard that doesn't have any of the, uh, we'll call it unnecessary processing, getting in the way or interfering with the purity of character of each of the vineyard blocks that goes into the blend. And uh, that's, that's what I see as for Cabernet at Quintessa, the Cabernet Sauvignon grapes that, we, that we've been using, I find more finesse and elegance in those with the gravity, of, of the gravity flow winemaking that we've had over the last uh, decade or more. And that gives us just, Cabernet becomes a more complete wine in, in, in its own in, in, in many cases. So you, you said two words that I love, finesse and elegance, and Larry has, has wrapped those into the, uh, around the core mm -hmm. of power. So if we take yeah. finesse and elegance with, it, with an essential power, is, is that what you were going for, for to the start? Yes. I think that those uh, three characteristics define Quintessa throughout, throughout since the year basically 94 when we started uh, mm -hmm. production. And... Uh, I didn't set out to do it, but I was hoping that we would produce from the property naturally without trying to do anything, to, without trying to sculpt it. So a, um, a wine with those characteristics, which is what I am interested in. What I am most interested in is that when somebody takes Quintessa, they say to me, you know, they, or, or to anybody, they, I don't like it, by the way, when they say, Oh, how interesting. And not at all. <laughs> what we want them to say is, oh, how delicious. And that, those characteristics are, are like that. Another very important thing that we seek is to be food friendly. This wine has to be appreciated in spite of food. It's easy to have a wonderful wine that you taste with no food. <clears throat> but the truth is that most wine, particularly this kind of wine, is, is taken, is drunk, it's an accompaniment, an enhancement to food. So it has to be very gentle on your, on your tasting, uh, uh, taste buds. Taste buds. Taste buds. It has to be very gentle on them and it has to it, it, occupy them for a short time so that your food also has a chance to show. And that is the characteristics of Quintessa that I appreciate very much. Um, I, I'm so glad that you talked about food and we're going to kind of segue into that here in a second. Um, it's killing me a little bit because we're having a little bit of trouble with Larry Stone's audio and being a master sommelier and Having worked with some of the great chefs, he's going to have a lot of cool stuff to tell us about that. So when we get him back, I'm going to make sure we get the full benefit of his expertise there. Um, but it, it's so true. I think that, you know, we Americans, another thing we invented was drinking wine as a cocktail. And I think the Europeans are very, they, they just can't sort of imagine that and the notion of having something to eat with the, with the wine. But it also, you said it's an enhancement to the food. And that is really true because there is the acidity and the structure that always have that capability to unlock these flavors. And I'm just curious, I mean, is being coming from Chile, 
and winemaking in Chile. Was, was that a cultural connection for you from, from home times or from being a world traveler? Because I don't know much about the culture of Chile and how connected the idea of food and wine together are for that. Well, Chile is very much a traditional Bordeaux uh, culture of wine. It was uh, Chile, the only place, by the way, in the New World was, was um, developed wine by Bordeaux rather than by Italy. And as such, we did always have wine with food. So wines were always a, a complement to food. So let's talk about that now. Um, you know, just for young Quintessa, what are some of your favorite things to pair it with? And, you know, you can go with classic and traditional if that's what you love, or if you've got some kind of wild and wooly crazy thing that you want to tell us about that we wouldn't have tried <laughs> on our own. We want to hear that too. Um, there's certainly nothing wrong with starting with a good rib steak, because yeah. uh, the rib steak is going to have a little bit more fat in it, which helps with the, the youthful tannins. Uh, so something like that, where you've got uh, a something that will help absorb the tannins, I think is is, is certainly great. Uh, I've seen uh, I've seen people do this with portobello mushrooms, with various kinds of olive oil or things like that. They get you the same thing without eating meat. Right. So it can be done both uh, uh, vegetarian or not. Uh, but uh, I'll start with that for sure. What about uh, what about cheese? Are either of you a fan of uh, cheese with this type of wine? And if so, are there any like insider tips or specific cheeses that you think oh they're a home run? I see a lot of Napa Valley pairing. Um, a, a wonderful local cheese that we all love. It's called Humboldt Fog with Napa wine, but I am not not the biggest fan because I think that sometimes it's sort of it's such a strong cheese, at least on the rind, that it overtakes it. I would think more subtle, but do you have any great cheese pairings for this wine? There's a cheese company in Point Reyes, and I should know it because we we have it here in the visitor center that matches beautifully with it. And as you say, it's a little bit more subtle. Uh, cow's milk that really that really goes wonderfully with with a uh, with a young Quintessa. I think like half the team here is scurrying off to the refrigerator to figure out what that cheese is. But how about you, Augustine? What are your favorite pairings for Quintessa? Well, you know there was a saying, as a matter of fact, in Chile, you you uh, buy wines with bread and you sell it with cheese. And what they mean by that is that it's easy to pass any wine as good when you're having strong cheese, because the cheese does something to you. It, some, somehow or other, it makes it um, more tolerant to, to acid or to tannin. So in order to really appreciate a beautiful wine, I'm not too fond of cheese. And if it is cheese, it has to be a very, a very mellow cheese, not something that's going to occupy all, all of your palate. Very true. Laura Worland, who's a cheese expert here and locally in San Francisco, taught me a lot about cheese and wine pairing. She said that if it's a if it's a, a monumental wine of, of importance uh, that's a red, it really has to be a mild, subtle cheese. So where we've landed at our house is we love Spanish Manchego with this mm -hmm. type of wine. That's right. That's it's so yeah. subtle and nice, yeah. and you can find yeah. great versions of it even in your supermarket. So you don't have to have you know a, a fabulous cheese store near you. Sheep. Yes, a sheep milk cheese, cheese from Spain. Um, we have, uh, oh, okay, it's the Point Reyes Toma is the cheese that uh, is here in the visitor center. So next time you come to Quintessa, you can try that pairing for yourself um, if you make an appointment. But um, it looks like we have Larry Stone, Master Sommelier and Estate Director for Quintessa, back online with Audia. So I'm going to hope that I will hear quickly from the technical team if that's not the case so that we don't have the... Um, the frustration of seeing mouth moving and not hearing sound in a, in a pleasurable way. But Larry, uh, this is an area that you, you obviously <laughs> ought to weigh in on big time. So maybe take us to some pairing thoughts for the young wine, and then how would you treat it differently for old wine? Because a lot of people who are tuned in have some of the back vintages as part of being uh, on the Quintessa mailing list for a long time. Well, I think with a, with a wine like Quintessa, and I hope you can hear me, tell me if you can. Yeah. Looking good. Yeah, okay, yeah, good. 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 So uh, uh, I think with a with a wine like Quintessa, you want to have a cheese that's not too strong. I mean, you don't need to sell this wine on on cheese uh, be, or because uh, it is so wonderful. You, you know, you want to let it really express itself. So I'd say a milder, semi-hard or hard cheese would be best. When it's younger, probably a little bit more like a semi-soft or semi-hard cheese, not too strong. You could do like a Taleme or you could do the cheese we have in the visitor center. You could do 
Even even you could even go to an aged uh, but re relatively mild sheep's milk cheese like a Manchego or Idia Sabal, which is a little bit smoked. So something that's not too stinky. You wouldn't want to go to a Tilsit or you wouldn't want to do a Brie. I, I agree uh, wholeheartedly with you, Andrea. I, I really don't want to do Humboldt Fog with this. This is something that's too rich. Humboldt Fog to me seems a little bit too sharp, even though it's creamy. And, uh, and then as the wine ages, you know, you could go to something a little bit older, so drier, like you could do an old Parmesan. Again, nothing really, really uh, intensely pungent, but something that has a saltiness to it. And, and I think that would allow the wine to express itself very well. So, you know, in those age, you could do old aged cheddar, you could do, manch you could do a great old Parmigiano Reggiano, you know, things that have the eyes in it, or an old Gouda. Those tend to be really easy matches. As I'm getting starving here, I'm wondering what time Sunshine or Dean and DeLuca close. Uh, <laughs> we're good for a while. We're hitting the cheese section big time when we're done. Um, so let's move on a little bit, though. I'm, I'm going to um, I'm going to throw in one of my favorite pairings for Napa Valley Cabernet based wines, um, and it's one that that it made me think of it when you talked about the um, the portobello mushroom. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how we ever discovered this because it's not the thing you typically think of. But my husband John and I, when it's summertime and there's lots of basil in season, we make boatloads of basil pesto and freeze it for when the basil's not in season. But the trick is uh, not too much uh, raw garlic, really light on that. Um, and we just think that it is one of the most amazing matches with Napa Valley Cabernet based wines. And it's super simple to either buy or make. But then you can do it on a crostini and, you know, not have to even cook or pasta or put it on a protein. But it can be the kind of thing, like you said, that a vegetarian can do. Mm -hmm. And really, it, it, it's one of those the pairings that, that blew me away. And I'm, I'm curious if anybody's ever tried that, basil pesto with these wines. Or Larry, have you? No? Uh, we lost Larry's audience. Yeah, yeah. I've, do, I've, okay. done it, I've done it unintentionally yeah. where uh, we were moving to Cabernet. Uh, and we still had some of the uh, some of the pesto, and uh, I've been surprised. But I, I, now that you said it's okay, I'll, I'll like it more. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also, controversial. But I like to pair very dark chocolate, and so I brought you a bar of my very favorite kind that goes with this style of wine. It's, wow. it's a really ninety percent. Ninety percent. It's the kind of chocolate that you probably wouldn't eat on your own because you would want a little more sweetness. But the, why this works is because it is so bittersweet that the sweetness of the fruit in the wine really unlocks the chocolate taste. And that particular one is so creamy that it doesn't pick up the tannins in the wine. So you now have the homework of time. Um, that we're going to go back now to uh, some of our guests in the audience. We're going to talk to Chris and John. Um, except oh that <laughs> she says, oh, my God. Okay. Well, yes, you are on the spot. Um, no, we're just excited to have you here and wondering what you're thinking. I, I know you're tasting along. I, I think you were tasting along, right? Uh, and yeah. Uh, wanted to, yeah, wanted to hear what you thought. Um, well, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you for having us. Also, I'd like to thank Augusta and Charles for a great harvest event last year. Yay. Well, thanks for coming. Really, really impressive and enjoyable to go to. Good. But I wanted to mention to you that uh, I did get a chance to try in the past couple of months a 95 Quintessa, which I thought was uh, had aged beautifully, um, lost a little bit of its fruit. It was, and according to Mr. Stone, it was probably, it was a medium acidity to it, but it had a lot of floral aromatics and totally lavender on the palate. Nice. Uh, formed a seamless line right down the palate, drank beautifully, let it sit in a decanter for about two hours. And it was really, uh, really impressive and certainly a treat. So well done to you guys, per usual. Thank you. Chris, I hope you were there for that occasion and got to enjoy the wine, too. <laughs> I hope it wasn't just John. And Are also, you? I'd like to, uh, if I could ask Mr. Stone a question, I'm currently yeah. studying for my advanced level sommelier certificate. And I was just curious, yeah. And I was curious <laughs> if you had any uh, words of advice. Great question. <laughs> uh, thanks for putting me Am on. Am I on now? You're, You're on. on. Okay, yeah. So, uh, well, Andrea knows that answer to this question as well because she's a master. And uh, But I think basically when you go through this uh, process, you need to study very hard and be confident that you know everything that you can possibly know prior to going to the test because the last time to start worrying is once you're taking the test. When you, The main thing is when you take, once you take the test, be confident that you've done all you can to pass it. 
before that time because otherwise it's too late anyway. And that's where people really fail is because they second guess themselves. So you have to have go into the test with a great deal of confidence and a great deal of preparation and then just let happen what happens. Go yeah, ahead. well said. And I would also add, and I'm sure you're doing this, uh, but a tasting group I think for most people is invaluable. Um, and you want to try to taste in the, in the format of the test as much as possible so you can get down your timing. Um, thank you so much for sharing the, uh, the insights on the 95. Let's go to Paula now, if we can pull her up. She's, uh, I think, I don't see her on our screen right now, so we'll see where, where that's coming. Um, the technical team's back there dutifully um, punching away at, at keyboard. So we'll talk to Paula in one second. Um, let's do a little bit more on, on the food pairing thing. You talked about, obviously, the rib steak. Something other than cheese. I mean, are there other favorite dishes of yours that sort of always hit the, hit the high notes? Well, to be honest, I, I like Quintessa with almost everything except when I have to salad or something in which I add acidity to it. Sure. Um, but, but I like it very much with pasta, for example, or with, with chicken dishes or even fish, uh, for example, with salmon. I like it very much. It's a heavy, heavier, oilier fish, which goes very, very well with Quintessa, I find. I guess I like Quintessa all the time. <laughs> we do that a lot at our house because we're, you know, we're sort of in that, you know, what are the five food groups that are good and good for you? And we think of salmon as one of those, and obviously red wine. So we do that a lot with uh, with Quintessa and this wine style. And I think it's great because you're, to your point, it's got the richness and the fat mm -hmm. to uh, make a nice counterpoint to um, to the tannin and the acidity and the power. Now Paula had a question about when is optimal for the 2004 or 2005 Quintessa. Um, do you have a thought on that? John? Yeah, I've tasted them both recently, and the okay. 2005 has was a cool vintage that was showing beautifully very early, and it's it's still in its in, in a what I'll call a, a window of just fantastic drinkability. Wow. So the 2005 has been in the zone for a couple of years, and will stay in it for another uh, sort of six to eight years, and I'd rather understate than overstate. 2004 is, is a, a, a richer, riper vintage and uh, was luscious from the beginning, but showing more nuance and complexity just in the last two, couple of years. And so um, you're certainly not going to have wasted one bit of your money if, if, you, drink them, uh, if you drink them tonight, say. But uh, they've, got, they've got a good long life ahead of them. Uh, the 04, as I said, has really just come into its own and showing more of the nuance just in the last couple of years. But... As a rule of thumb, five to seven years past the vintage, you're getting into a zone of ideal drinkability where you're going to feel like you've gotten your money's worth. And that, that plateau or that, 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 that zone can go on for a decade or more, depending on the wine. So I'm here in 2005, really in the zone right now. Yeah. And the 2004 is pretty, it's but it's, in, it's, yeah. got, it's just coming into it. So maybe uh, you'd reverse the polarity and actually yep. have the younger wine sooner. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, that's a great thing about an experience like this. You get to ask the source and somebody who's likely to have tasted this wine, and you don't want to experiment with something like that. The O3 is drinking beautifully right now. Wow. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so that, that one is, is, whatever its peak is, it's somewhere in there for sure. And I've had that over the last two or, three, two or three years, and it's just fantastic. Excellent. So that's very exciting. Um, We've got a couple more questions here, but at, before we get to those, because I would like to see if we can get, the, get them on screen, um, I wanted to find out, going back to the notion of, of Bordeaux as the inspiration for Quintessa, is there an estate that sort of has the stylistic uh, parody that you would, would feel is, is what Quintessa, Quintessa represents? When, when we started Quintessa, we had here a very respected French Bordeaux uh, winemaker or, or blender, Jacques Oiseau. And Jacques Oiseau sort of explained to me, he said to me, you know, Augustine, I don't know if you really want my advice because to be honest, I find that the wines that, that the California winemakers want to do are too powerful, too strong, you would call them uh, sort of uh, uh, country wines. And I think that what I would do with Quintessa after tasting the wines 
is something quite like Cheval Blanc. And, and he sculpted the wines for a few years, and he was very happy that it sort of, in some sort of a way, was a Cheval Blanc style, which, of course, I, you know, take my chapeau off to, to Cheval Blanc, but it's, um, I think Cheval Blanc has a lot of uh, Cabernet uh, Franc, right? Cabernet and Franc. Uh, we had a lot of Cabernet Franc at first in Quintessa, and winemakers, particularly Charles, likes Cabernet Sauvignon better. So, you know, um, I, I would like to think that we are different and, and our style is sort of our own style. I don't think that you would confuse it with any Bordeaux wine, although the model is similar in the sense that it's one property dedicated to one wine, one winery dedicated to one wine. And the name of the wine is the name of the property. It doesn't say what variety it is or anything. It just says the name of the property. Fantastic, like Quintessa. Quintessa. Um, Darlene, I want to go back to you. She was one of the first to sign on with us earlier, and um, I think from, from Nevada. And uh, just wanted to hear what you're thinking, if you have any specific questions for our illustrious guest here. Well, Charles, hi. When we were there, my husband John and I in a, a group, we had a uh, lunch. And we had some, I don't know exactly, I can't remember the exact dishes. It was fantastic to pair things with. But it was more nutty and grainy and vegetable. And I don't know, I, I found that to go extremely well um, with your wine. And so I don't even remember if we had a meat. I mean, I don't, I don't even, I don't remember that. I just remember. We had chicken. We had chicken? Okay. So, I that's, mean, I found that. Fantastic, though. that is, I'm really glad that you mentioned that because I, I think it's funny that it was chicken, but I think of chicken as the blank canvas for wine yeah. and what's served with it and around it, whether that's the bed that it's on. And it sounds like you had some sort of a, you know, bean or grain type of bed, maybe mm -hmm. almost like a, a stewy legume type thing. To me, that's a beautiful match, especially with the more elegant styles and the Rutherford dusty styles of Napa Cab because you really bring out the minerality in the wine, which is, you know, kind of what you want to go for. So I'm glad that you mentioned that because that's a great idea um, for people to, to, to consider. I'm guessing it might have been Augustine and Valeria Chef Maria who did that because she does the, the, the grains beautifully to the point where you, you forget what the meat was that was with it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Wow, what a great, um, and you know, it's, it's interesting because your roots in Chile, some of the best, uh, you know, mother grains and ancient grains come from that part of the mm -hmm. world that are so, so uh, earthy and, and gravelly and gritty, and they just have lots of wonderful flavor to them, and of course, they're really healthy. So basically, we have a doctor's note for red wine, healthy <laughs> grains, dark chocolate, getting better all the time. I remember that, so and you. I remember... The story, your story, Augustine, and just that was so fascinating to uh, to us, knowing where you came from, and what you went through in various continents, <laughs> and yeah, and yeah. then and anyway, and Charles, I think your daughter was thirteen at the time. I don't remember, but exactly, but um, hello. <laughs> We you should come back soon. I was going to say, it's time for you to come back. It's been a long time ago. Come and see us real soon, for sure. Um, we're going to go now to uh, Joe Dennis, who I don't know how long he's been tuned in, but he just showed up on our monitor, and um, it looks like, uh, I can't tell what your T-shirt says, but anyway, you're tasting along with us. What did you want to uh Ask the guys and about Quintessa. Are you having a chance to taste along with us? No, I'm just listening along and just learning. So, great pleasure to be on. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us. Are you have you uh, are you a Quintessa fan? Have you had the chance to taste it a few times or visit the winery? Absolutely, I've been to the winery once. We're planning to go again in July. We just joined the club, and uh, definitely it's a, one of our favorites. So, good, uh, good. Well, I'm a little you bit the uh, 06 and the 07 and. Uh, uh, haven't tried the 2010 yet, but we're looking forward to it. Fantastic. Well, so probably some of these culinary ideas are giving you food for thought for sure. Um, it's always fun for me to kind of, you know, decide to open a great wine and kind of plan the whole menu around it. And, of course, that's what we do here in wine country because we care a whole lot about food, but the first thing you want to do is, you know, show off the rock star, which is the wine. Absolutely. So, Sounds great. We'll um, be back again for our 42nd birthday, come July. So. Oh, my goodness. Great, thank you. Fantastic. 
So let's, why don't we visit now with um, uh, Jim and Linda. And are you guys tasting the 2010? I know you're tasting along with us, but I don't know if it's something that you already had or if it's the current release, the pre-release. No, we're, we're tasting the 2010. Yeah. Yay. And I just made a uh, big taste for mm -hmm. and roasted garlic pizza to go with it. Oh, that sounds great. So now we're we're uh, we're pairing with pizza, which you know hard to go wrong there. So that sounds fantastic. Any questions for Augustin or Charles or Larry? Wow, look at that pizza! Talk with your mouth full because we want to know what it tastes like. That sounds great. And yeah. you asked earlier where we are. We're just sitting in the wine room in our house. Wow. Beautiful wine room. All right. Yes, that's a gorgeous room. We can understand why you're there. Fantastic for the first time. And she loved it. Oh, good. Well, thank you. Cheers to you. That's fantastic. Hello. Cheers. Hello. So uh, we're going to be wrapping up pretty soon, but I wanted to uh, ask Augustine an, an important question. Um, talk about the future of Quintessa. Well, the future of Quintessa, of course, is, is very much associated with the future of wine and fine wines in particular. Um, I think Quintessa forms part of, of a certain group of wines which are based on a terroir, a type of terroir which is not growing in the world at all. And wine consumption and appreciation is growing. So I think that it's going to be there. It's a long term. Uh, Quintessa never wanted to be a sort of a cult wine. What we want to be is a classic. We want to be the representative of Rutherford, basically for for at least two centuries. Let's put it that way. Wow. <laughs> Fantastic. So, um, lots of everybody who has children, just you know, put Quintessa <laughs> onto the uh, the inheritance, and and they'll be the next generation and the next and the next to uh, come and visit the winery and have some of the same experiences that you have. Um, I think we do have to wrap. Am I right with our, with our, our group here? We got five more minutes. Okay, so so good. Um, we haven't had a chance to check in with Robin Scott, and I don't know if we can get her audio or not, but um, they'll let me know that here in a second. Um, Robin, we haven't had a chance to talk to you, so jump on in here. Pooch is Marigo. She says hi. Hey, um, we say hi too. I was actually just at the vineyard on April 6th celebrating my 50th birthday with seven Happy of birthday. my best girlfriends. That's awesome. Girl trip. I had a chance to, and to taste uh, the 2010 there and absolutely, along with the 2006, the 2008, and the 2009, had a fantastic tasting, and I will concur that the Toma, Point Reyes Toma oh, uh, cheese is phenomenal with it, and I'm trying to find some place in Texas that I can get that cheese. Um, but uh, I... I Elegance is a way, but I also, to describe the wine, but I also just love how smooth it is. Mm. Um, I like big red, uh, big bad reds, but this one is big and bad, but it's also so smooth and delicate at the same time. So uh, just love, this is my favorite wine. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. That's something that we put a lot of effort and thought into is how to get the, the, the power to show through, but to have it have that elegance and smoothness all the way through to, uh, in, from the beginning to the end of the mountain. And I do have a quick question. I know some of the vineyards in the Napa Valley area have gone to different um, techniques besides the pour over when you're trying to, to mix the, the grape juice. Yep, so do the pump over, yep. The, the pour over, um, the way that you do it doesn't damage um, the seeds or the, the skins to... to uh, upset the balance of the wine. Yeah, you, you have, with any with any uh, technique, you have to be careful. But with the pump over, we make sure that we're just getting the liquid. And for Cabernet, which is actually Cabernet Sauvignon as a grape, wants to give you the color and flavor very easily, so you don't have to work very hard to get the intensity. So in a sense, you just want to be fairly gentle with that. And the pump over actually works very well. With other grape varieties like Pinot Noir. People go into punch downs and things like that to really get the flavor out. Uh, I've tried both with Cabernet. It's certain, punching down doesn't hurt, but pump over the work great. And uh, done right, it's uh, as, as delicate a, uh, a procedure as anything. Wow. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you. Robin, thank you so much for giving your input. All of you who joined us, Joe Dennis, Jim and Linda, I'm sure I'm not going to say everybody, uh, Paula, Darlene, 
and uh, most importantly, um, just everybody <coughs> who, who tuned in. Um, obviously, 2010 is a pre-release. If you're on the mailing list, make sure to check your email so you can participate oh, in that. Charles Thomas Weinmaker, yeah. Augustine Hunez. Yeah, come on, come on, sit down here. You're going to be on the best camera. <laughs> and a wine icon, Larry Stone, live from New York, master sommelier colleague and always eloquent speaker about wine and pairing. Thank you so much. Thank you all for the opportunity for me to come and play in the sandbox with you and taste and celebrate. <laughs> Thank you. All of you.